In this special installment of the Dallas Prospect, the focus is on you, the viewer. We're talking about your thoughts, your questions, even your opinions on the state of the Dallas Mavericks, giving you a chance to amplify your questions or general opinion to the audience at large, beyond just the comments section. For this debut installment, however, I collected comments from the recent slew of videos that I've put out. Without further ado, let's dive in. While there has been a lot of excitement about the Mavericks offseason, one little consistent pushback I have seen has been my praise for Nico Harrison. As Mavs debater brings up, the reason the front office has had to rally to the extent that it has is because they were so putrid last offseason. And that's a fair argument because, as others have also brought up, it's more than just the misassessment of the Jalen Brunson situation. There were multiple opportunities in which Dallas could have made their roster better and simply fumbled the bag, whether it was bringing in players who didn't really fit, who couldn't really contribute much, or misusing guys when they had them. There are a number of fair criticisms there. So the idea that it's too early to give Nico his flowers, I think that's a fair argument. However, to me, last offseason was really the growing pains for Nico Harrison. I think Dallas misevaluated the previous year's unparalleled success and assumed that they would largely be able to run it back with a similar group. And because of their success and the fact that Jalen Brunson really ascended to a new stage in the postseason run, they badly misjudged that whole situation. They were expecting to be able to pay him because they could pay him more than anyone else. They assumed they would be able to do it when the offseason came and that they wouldn't really have to worry about too much competition. The problem is they turned down multiple opportunities, whether it was the previous offseason, which would have been when Nico first arrived, or even as late as the All-Star break, to lock down Jalen Brunson to a multi-year deal that makes his new contract look like peanuts. And even then, if they really wanted Jalen Brunson here, they could have done it. They allowed Jalen to walk because ultimately, it would have taken a full max to keep him here. Given his body of work, I agree with the assessment, but it doesn't change that they badly fumbled it. To me, this was Nico Harrison's welcome to the NBA moment. And as bad as it was last offseason, punctuated above all by the Jalen Brunson situation, I really do feel like he has recovered well this year. There's no doubt the turnover on the roster the last two years has been significant. But this year, there seems to be a very clear vision in the type of player that they're bringing in and how they are modeling this roster to be unique, filled with versatile defenders and guys who can shoot threes at a high clip. There's also some flyers of real intrigue, guys whose value might not look terribly high, but whose potential fit is fantastic. And then you have to look at the whole situation with the draft itself. Yes, that took a lot of chance and a lot of dumb luck, you could even say. But the way that they were able to navigate the draft night itself, trading back, still getting lively, and then turning around and making another trade that results in getting both Rashawn Holmes and Omax Prosper. That is, that is masterful. You can talk as, as much as you want about how bad last offseason was, this offseason has been a complete 180, and it has given me a little bit of faith moving forward in Nico Harrison and his ability to adjust. Now, are we going to need to see that beyond one offseason? Of course. But at the very least, to do those things and to convince Kyrie Irving to re-sign in Dallas, that's a win. Huh. <laughs> All right, yeah, let's, let's talk about it here. Blather wants to talk about Rashawn Holmes and his legal issues, which I did not bring up in my preview of Rashawn Holmes and his potential fit in Dallas. Now, the reason, as I just said there in that explanation, it was previewing his fit in Dallas. Blather talks about, it's a 17-minute video I put out, and I didn't mention the court cases, which he says heavily affected his availability. 
As such, I should have done more research. Pure and simple, the reason for this decision was because I was trying to separate the on the court aspect from the off the court drama. The conversation was Holmes fit in Dallas, not a legal battle and defamation lawsuit against his ex-wife. So while that may have played a role in Holmes' minutes and role diminishing last season, it doesn't change the fact that he had gotten buried on the depth chart after the Sabonis edition, and that that was a major factor, or the broader conversation I also addressed about his availability throughout his career. So for those interested, here's an abridged recap. I'm taking no position on any of this. I'm just telling you what has been reported. In March of 2022, Rashawn Holmes was accused of domestic violence against his ex-wife, whom he divorced in 2019. He was also accused of physically abusing his six-year-old son, claims which Holmes denied. A local publication, the Sacramento Bee, reported on the allegations, prompting the Kings to release a statement condemning domestic violence in general and stating that they would be monitoring the situation. However, prior to the article even being published, the Kings had already announced that Holmes would not be playing for the remainder of the season due to personal reasons. In March of this year, Holmes filed a 64-page lawsuit against the Sacramento Bee and his ex-wife over the claims of abuse. Holmes labeled the articles as irresponsible, racist, and false, contending they caused harm to his image and reputation by depicting him as an abuser. The filing also contends that the B had access to court documents that contradicted the abuser narrative, including a decision in the Sacramento Superior Court that denied his ex's request for a restraining order. Following this decision, his ex took their son to Georgia regardless, where a Georgia court eventually ruled in Holmes' favor and returned his son to his custody. The defamation suit was settled just back in July on the 20th, and there were no monetary compensations included. Again, is this worth noting? Sure, I see your argument, but the intent was to focus on the basketball side of things since the matter had been resolved. Whenever outside real-world issues arise, the discourse tends to turn ugly and shift away from the premise of talking basketball, which is what this channel seeks to do. Basically, I've learned in the past these issues are way too complex, and the information we have is way too limited to really be able to talk on them and just speculate recklessly. Let's turn our attention now to the conversation about the center position. As Matthias points out, Dallas still needs a center. He is excited about the Derrick Jones Jr. signing since it's an athletic defensive wing, but it's not really necessary for Dallas, he said. I respectfully disagree on that. I think Derrick Jones Jr., while he's not going to get a ton of minutes in the Dallas rotation, I think the minutes he does provide are going to be very important. He is a subpar three-point shooter, but he's a guy whose defensive versatility is next level. He's in the 99th percentile. So you're talking about a guy that can come in, really hold things down, provide high energy, is an elite rim runner, cuts well without the ball. All things that are very good, and he can protect the rim a little bit. That is exactly the kind of player you need. So to have that need... And that exception, I think it's a fantastic value addition and one that, as we talked about, Dallas has been looking to make for several years now. Shifting our conversation to Derek Lively and his outlook as a prospect. Frank mentions that Lively's potential has him hyped. To be fair, he doesn't think he's going to be Hakeem on defense or anything, but he is really excited about his versatility as a defender despite having more traditional size. And I got to say, I'm really right there with you. I think that Lively is a fantastic addition to this team. I think he's going to be more than Tyson 2.0. Yes, everyone likes to talk about Tyson 2.0, and there are reasons for that comparison, which I talked about in my initial video. But really, I'm looking at Lively and his slow developing offensive game we've really only seen in the last two years him developing that outside shot and i think that's going to be the real difference maker for him that allows him to play in this more modern nba wherein i think even tyson in his prime would struggle a lot of nights now with how the game has continued to evolve over the last decade so yes lively fantastic pickup i agree he's not going to be hakeem defensively but i do think he's going to be a fantastic defender. Definitely a guy 
whose versatility is going to give you a lot of help. That rim protection is going to be next level, assuming he can be a little bit more disciplined and keep his feet down on the ground, go straight up. As long as he can do that and add a respectable outside shot, whether it be just from the corners, where in pro day he splashed 14 straight, or even in transition, like Dirk used to do trailing on the break. Either of those is going to make him a phenomenal weapon for the Mavericks and definitely a guy who can anchor your defensive effort moving forward. We move from one very enticing center addition to the re-signing of a less spectacular one. J.P. Cantrell is not exactly hyped about Dwight Powell coming back, and I can understand that. He says, if Dwight Powell is the starting center, this will be one of the worst front courts in the league. Yeah, you know, Long-term, Powell will not be your center. I, I keep joking, it's death taxes and Dwight Powell starting at center for your Dallas Mavericks. These are all the inevitable facts of life. But with that being said, I do think that there is, I do think there is an expiration date eventually on this. We don't know the exact date, but there is going to be a time where whether it's Lively continuing to ascend and he supplants Dwight Powell in the starting role, or if the Mavericks are going to find something a little different, be it Rashawn Holmes or some other or some other option there, I do think it's inevitable that one of these guys will pass up Dwight. My gut says Lively is going to be the guy. It just might take a little bit of time. So in the meantime, Dwight Powell might just be there. And that doesn't mean that he's going to have to play 20 plus minutes a night. Regardless, I do think his minutes are going to diminish. We know what Dwight Powell is. He's a great locker room guy, a good culture guy. He's loved in the locker room. But we've also seen in, what, three different playoff runs now? He's borderline unplayable in the postseason. We can't have that. Hustle, effort, attitude, that's all great. But you can't bank on him long term, and that's why Dallas is having to develop something. But since it takes time to develop something, you got Dwight Powell back on a respectable deal. It is what it is. In my most recent video, I talked about Josh Green and why I'm actually still pretty high on him and his potential. Now, this one had a lot of interesting debate. It hasn't been out very long yet, the video, but there has been a lot of interesting debate about Green and whether or not this is a make-or-break year for some people and where some people actually see him as potentially the Mavericks' third best player. As Moneybag Drew points out, He's got Josh Green averaging 10 to 14 points per game this year. Six rebounds, two and a half to three and a half assists as well. That's a pretty stacked stat line. I like that. Ultimately, though, he says it's up to Luka and Kai to share the ball. He's also pretty confident that Grant and Green should both average career highs this season, with each of them averaging between 10 to 14 points. Again, very ambitious. Is it possible? Yes. Do I think it's likely they both do that? Probably not. I, I, I do think your lion's share is going to go to the combination of Luka and Kyrie, and you might have one more guy that's averaging in that 14-ish point range. The odds that you have two of them doing that feels less likely. But if Green is 10 to 12 points and you got a similar barometer for Grant, that's still good. In that same conversation about Josh Green and his time allotted to develop, Texas fan for life 80 says that he deserves the same amount of time as the other young talents on this roster. He is just 22 years old and he has shown improvement in each of his years, which as Texas fan points out is all you can really ask of a player. So he wants that everyone to be patient and understand it's a process to develop. I do think that he will continue to develop. My question is ultimately whether or not he can reach that ceiling I know there are questions about his elbow. He missed a fair bit of time last year with a, an elbow injury, and now he's even missing time playing for the national team about what his availability is because of the elbow, it seems like. So there are real questions there. It's an unusual injury that doesn't seem to have a lot of clarification, and it seems to be a nagging thing for the sugar glider. That aside, I am high on his potential. And I agree he should be afforded the time to develop. Now we're getting a little bit spicy here. I think Omax's ceiling is higher than Dorian Finney-Smith's, and I also don't think it'll take him as long to develop as Finney-Smith did. Right off the bat, I think that's a fair assessment. 
at least on the offensive side for sure. Because Dorian Finney-Smith was a slow burn developing project. It took about five years for him to really peak with what we saw during that, again, Western Conference run. I do think Dorian regressed a bit last year. I'll be curious to see what he does moving forward. But all the same, I don't think it's going to take five years for Omax to be a very viable offensive player. And I love the comp here that IMB Truth brings up. He mentions he doesn't know if Omax can be Sean Marion. I think that's actually a very interesting comp. Do I think he's going to have the same ceiling? No, but I think he can be in that same make and model, if you will. He can be one of those guys that his game resembles it with the versatility and the ability to find points, the ability to knock down some timely buckets. That's a perfect, perfect aspirational assessment, I think, for Omax, seeing him as Matrix Light. And chiming in as well with that is Lucas Skywalker 7791 saying he thinks Omax will pass what Dodo did. However, he adds he thinks he'll do it in the first half of the season. I'm not going to put that kind of ambition on any rookie, let alone a guy that's not taken in the top five or ten. But I do really love the potential I see from Omax and what I think he will ultimately bring to the table for Dallas. Dorian Finney-Smith, again, down year last year. But I think you really should not discount how good of a player he was for so long for the Mavericks. So, with all due respect, I'm high on Omax. I think he's going to be a phenomenal player. I think he'll be able to be a very solid role player for the Mavericks. But I'm going to hit pause on the idea that within a half season, he's already supplanted the best of what we got from Dorian. But that'll do it for today's special viewer comments edition of the Dallas Prospect. Thank you for tuning in. Keep submitting your comments. You can always either DM me on Twitter at Dallas Prospect or Instagram to submit your feedback and your comments. If I like it and I think it adds something to the conversation, we can bring it into one of these future videos. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember... Every legend was once a prospect.